joins us online now from Chicago. Dan, stick with us as well. Okay, Richard, just walk us through how you see this all playing out because no U.S. official, let me be clear, has given me any indication, at least behind the scenes, um, that they expect any kind of deal in the near term. Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. I do think it's quite pessimistic in the short term for any sort of return to the JCPOA. That's the formal uh, name of the Iran nuclear deal from 2015, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, I do think, however, we are seeing the Iranians set the table for a new negotiation where we recall Joe Biden, when he was elected president, said he wanted to negotiate a longer, stronger deal to replace the JCPOA, knowing that it was very flawed limited and had expiration dates coming up. Uh, We've gone from that to wanting to just get back to the JCPOA over the summer. We're now in a place where I think the Iranians are saying the JCPOA is the starting point for negotiations, and we are going to negotiate sanctions relief for fewer concessions from there. Uh, So really a turn of fortunes for the Iranians 10 months ago, up against the wall, to use a uh, football metaphor from, from the United States, Uh, The Iranians were on their own one yard line 10 months ago, and now they're driving into the American red zone. So rate the progress of talks for us so far. How would you give this in a score out of 10, for example? Because we've heard anecdotally, and you're also just flagging, that it seems like the Iranians are basically winning at the moment. Yeah, it's hard to score this. Uh, I mean, you can't really take the diplomats' uh, public comments at face value, especially from the European Union. Uh, I've always felt that if the Iranians walk into a room and smile, the European Union will give a press conference that it was an amazing diplomatic victory for the day. Uh, So the the truth is, what is really on the table and what is Iran doing on the ground? On the ground right now, they are expanding their enrichment at 60 percent purity level, just a stone's throw away uh, from 90 percent weapons grade. Uh, We have uh, obviously the comments from the International Atomic Energy Agency last week that Iran is denying access to certain sites, limiting the IAEA inspections and verifications. Uh, So it's going in the wrong direction on the ground. Really no accountability from the Europeans, no accountability from Washington at the IAEA board meeting last week. Uh, There's no discussion of snapback of UN sanctions at the Security Council. Uh, So the question is, what will be the plan B for the Biden administration and its European allies if all we see from the Iranians is How much will you pay us for as few concessions as possible? So is there a plan B? I know you've written before about this compliance for compliance approach that President Joe Biden appears to be favoring. Is that still the right way forward? Uh, I think at this point, because the JCPOA started expiring last October with the expiration of the international arms embargo, We have additional restrictions scheduled to lift in two years and then two years after that and so on. Uh, This is really an old deal that doesn't have a lot of value at this point, especially given Iran's nuclear advances this year uh, amidst the lack of sanctions enforcement by the Biden administration. Uh, I think what we have to do is push the reset button that starts with a snapback at the Security Council of all the UN restrictions on Iran. But all these sunset provisions, these restrictions that are scheduled to expire, no longer expire. Take that away from the Iranians. That's really what they want. Uh, At that point, if you were to bridge the gap between Europe and the United States, something that we haven't had for the last couple of years, uh, bring back a transatlantic position on sanctions enforcement against Iran, alongside a new Security Council resolution that reimposes all these restrictions, I think you'll get the Iranians' attention very quickly And of course, there has to be a bottom line from the West. Will we be willing to use military action to stop Iran from developing nuclear weapons? And will we make sure Tehran knows we intend to use such an option? Now, Richard, I think everybody knows that the United States is not going to do that at this point, don't you think? I mean, what's fascinating about that is, of course, these Gulf Arab producers, you know, we talk to these folks all the time. We're based right here uh, in the Arabian Gulf. And essentially, you know, they've even moved on from this one because they understand that the United States and its allies in Europe are not going to be willing to stick their necks out on the line here, even with the fact that we've got the Fifth Fleet patrolling these waterways, right? Because at the end of the day, um, you know, they're already talking to Tehran. They have to do it. The Saudis have had at least three, almost, I think, four rounds of talks with them. I don't know how far they're getting, um, but they've confirmed to me those conversations are having. The UAE, of course, um, they're talking to them as well. I mean, for them, it seems as if when it comes to trusting the United States and U.S. foreign policy, the ship sailed, right? 
Well, I think trust of the United States is definitely wavering throughout the region. We've seen that uh, since the Biden administration came in, sort of push reset on the U.S.-Saudi relationship, the U.S.-UAE relationship, question marks about support for the Abraham Accords, those normalizing relationships with Israel, and of course, the intent to go back to the Iran nuclear deal, which we know the Sunni Gulf Arabs uh, and Israel both oppose. Uh, I would caution we should not take, again, public statements. Uh, some symbolic meetings at face value. Uh, there's obviously a lot of pressure being exerted by the Biden administration on the Gulf Arabs uh, in exchange uh, for U.S. security commitments going forward. Uh, the relationship is in a fragile state. And so uh, to have some symbolic conversations with the Iranians uh, cost nothing uh, to the Sunni Arabs. In private, uh, they remain very opposed uh, in all of my conversations to a return to the JCPOA. Uh, but you know, one thing that is good about all of this is that, in fact, they look around the region, they look around the world. What's the one country that shares all of their values and views as, with respect to Iran? Uh, it's the state of Israel. And so uh, actually, uh, for as far as normalization goes and integration of the Middle East, uh, that's the one bright spot in all of this. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. <laughs>